Trails 150th New Social Environment. I'm Cal McKeever, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today and um, for a conversation between Sean Scully, Deborah Solomon, David Carrier, and David Fair. We're also thrilled to have the poet Matthew Rohrer, who will be reading to close today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock, and Munsee peoples. Note the unceded means the land that was never surrendered by the native people. We acknowledge that many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings unfolding across the country, following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McGaddy, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, and Toyin Salau, and in, in response to generations of structural violence against black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support the ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce today's hosts and guests, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's hosts. Deborah Solomon is the art critic for WNYC. Her reviews appear on Morning Edition and The Brian Lehrer Show. Solomon is a longtime contributor to The New York Times, and she's also a prize-winning biographer. Her books include Jackson Pollock, a biography, and Utopia Parkway, the life and work of Joseph Cornell. She is currently writing a biography of the artist Jasper Johns. She lives on the Upper West Side with her husband, Kent, and their Corgi Bell, a frequent visitor to the American Museum of Natural History Dog Run. David Carrier, a former professor of philosophy at Carnegie Mellon University and Chamney F Family Professor in Cleveland, has been a lecturer in the Council of the Humanities and Class of 1932, fellow in philosophy, Princeton University, a Getty Scholar and a Clark Fellow. He's lectured in China, Europe, India, Japan, New Zealand, and North America. In spring 2009, he was a Fulbright Luce lecturer in Beijing, and lectured also in Taiwan. His recent books include A World Art History and Its Objects, Penn State 2008, and Proust Warhol, Analytical Philosophy of Art, Peter Lang 2008. He has published catalog essays for many museums and art criticism for Apollo, Art Critical, Art Forum, Artists, and Burlington Magazine. He's been a guest editor for the Brooklyn Rail. And today's guests, David Fair is the curator of 20th Century and Contemporary Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, Budapest. He earned his PhD in art history from the Otvos Loran University, Budapest. His research focuses on the art history of Hungary and Eastern Europe after 1960 and theoretical questions of contemporary painting. He's contributed to such publications as International Pop, uh, Georg Baselitz Review with Preview, um, and Art, art in Hungary, 1956 to 1980, Double Speak and Beyond, uh, Promote, Tolerate, Ban, Art and Culture in the Cold War Hungary, and Dora Mar. He regularly publishes reviews and essays in many Hungarian art magazines and journals. He was a temporary lecturer at the Otvos Loran uh, University Budapest at the Hungarian University of Fine Arts in Budapest. Fair's most recent curatorial work includes Bacon, Freud, the Painting School of London, co-curated with Alana Kripa at the Museum of Fine Arts Hungarian National Gallery, and Sean Scully, Passenger, a Retrospective, which we are going to look at today. He was a DAAD fellow at the Freie Universität in, Ber in Berlin in 2013-2014, and in 2019-2020, he received the Erno Kalai Scholarship for Art Historians and Art Critics. And Sean Scully was born in Dublin in 1945 and grew up in the south of London, where his family moved in 1949. He began painting in the late 60s and moved to New York in 75, became an American citizen in 83. Scully has shown extensively both, both nationally and internationally, including most recently at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, Washington, DC, uh, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, West Britain, England, and the, the, Russian, uh, the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Connecticut, the National Gallery in London, and the San Giorno Magare for the uh, Venice Biennale. <clears throat> Upcoming solo exhibitions include the Albertina Vienna, a 2020 retrospective at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. All right, David, Deborah. Pass it over to you. Thank you. Well, Sean, hello, yes. there. hello there in Budapest. Hi. Hi. Was it hard to get all your work to Budapest, considering the current circumstances? No, it was simple. 
Um, <laughs> you know, I had my mask off for, for a few minutes and we'll maintain uh, social distancing. Um, so, um, <clears throat> no, we, the shippers are working as ever. There's no, there's no problem with that. Um, we have tested, COVID tested, which we did, and we are negative. And uh, my assistant who came here said to me, that was the safest, safest plane in the world because everybody on there was COVID tested negative. <laughs> so it was literally impossible to get sick on the flight. Um, anyway, so these, these are early works and you can see that I started out as a figurative painter. Um, so we're gonna swing the lens over there, that's it. And you see these seats that um, are highly abstract and colorful figures of paintings. paintings. And interestingly here is the first, the first landline paintings which date from 65 and I, like uh, as I do a lot of my work, I tend to um, park things and then find them later. So it's, it's sometimes strange to see something from deep past, you know, from 95, it's a long time ago, a lifetime ago, and then I pick it up and start doing it again. It's very interesting to me. And these are from this. This painting, by the way, is one that I made at Harvard. You know, I managed to scrounge my way to America. I got a fellowship to Harvard. Um, which gave me the princely sum of $2,400 a year to live on. So <laughs> as you can imagine, if, <laughs> I lived like a king in, uh, in Cambridge, <laughs> house mine. But anyway, while I was there, I had a big studio on, on, uh, on, in Harvard Yard in a building that's now been knocked down called Hunt Hall. Hunt was a revivalist architect. And I made these paintings with insects and uh, broken grids, overlaid grids, and less uniform perhaps than some of the things that I've been making in England. So it was very good for me to be there. You know, I opened my mind a lot. And, um, this is a bit later, of course. This is this black one here is a painting. Bingo. That black one there is a painting that I made in New York when I was heavily involved in uh, post minimalism. And as you can see, it's an extremely rigorous painting where um, all the surfaces are 50 50. That color, that dark brown, does not get repeated down there. So there's, all the surfaces are very democratically divided. I made paintings like this for about five years when I was in New York. John, it's very interesting if we could go back just for a minute to that Harvard painting, because that's really a jump ahead, isn't it? I mean, because the, I know the New York grids, you were spoke of yourself as protecting yourself and being harbored against the environment, but that, that Harvard one, I mean, you have that great diagonal coming down into it. Yeah, well, I have to say that my year in <laughs> Cambridge was, um, was uh, really an incredible happy year for me, uh -huh. you know, because um, if you can imagine this, I went from Newcastle 
which is a failed steel town in the north of England, to Harvard. And uh, there I was in America, but I wasn't in New York, which was very fortunate. Uh -huh. I wasn't ready for New York. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm not sure who is, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so then, as you know, by right now I jumped ship. You know, I decided to break open with uniformity of the painting that I've been working with. And I started making these paintings where I patched things together and uh, it looks kind of broken. And I actually was thinking quite a lot in those days, I remember, of cubism. Because the paintings are, are really starting to look like um, mythic works. You know, the picture edge is broken in this painting. The, the style of the painting within it is, is different. Some of it is more carefully painted, the other parts are rougher. Yeah. And this is called Adoration. It was made in, uh, I think it was made in 81. I'm not sure. 82. 82, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it took me a long time to make it, I remember. I kept pulling it apart and putting it back together again. And uh, it was, yeah, it was quite a struggle because it's a painting of exploration. It's a painting that I like very much. And as you can see, there's a lot of pink in it. And um, again, that's making a reference to cubism certainly analytical cubism. But the idea of breaking things apart was very important to me at this point. We point out that by now you had left Harvard and you were living oh, in New yeah. York City because at first you said you felt fortunate not to be in New York, but I feel that these paintings do have some of the scale of New York and kind of the bang together look of the city. So what was it like coming to New York for you? Well, it was, um, it was an incredible struggle, of course, because um, the pressure in New York to stay, to stay in New York, to stay, to stay afloat is tremendous. And, um, it forces artists, and to this day, young artists, to um, look for big spaces where they can work, and then the means to pay for those big spaces. So it favors people who have financial backing, which I didn't really have any of. Uh, so I tended to, work on construction and uh, I was very fortunate I, I, I was teaching at Parsons and at Princeton um, and I, I became integrated I must say very quickly in New York with some downtown artists and I, I was very influenced by as you call it itself, the slap together quality of New York, the confrontational quality. And these paintings, I think, are really portraits of the city. The portraits of, of dislocation and confrontation. They're completely different from London art, aren't they? In terms of the feeling of the place. Well, I couldn't stay in London because 
It's, I wanted to be around people who understood the causes of abstraction so that I could advance it. Because I, I don't think, to be perfectly honest, that you ever do anything entirely alone. I think that um, everything is a collaboration. Otherwise, we wouldn't have school of, we wouldn't have places that are right. intense at one time or another in history, which we've always had, of course. Hmm. And York is, is um, difficult, but it's also rewarding in the sense that some of the relationships that I've made are, are, are deeply loyal. And some of the writers that wrote on me have revealed something in my work that allowed me to understand it better myself. And I, that, I think, wasn't really happening in London. So I had to, I had to be in New York. Do you have any, any, um, any choice? So here's a painting over there that I still own called The Baver. Um, that was shown at David McKee. <clears throat> and, um, and then you see it's pretty far from minimalism and it starts to become figurative again or bringing back the idea of nature and the subject which I thought was so important if painting were to become vital again because, uh, you know, at the end of the 70s, let's say, even to the 80s, it seems to be based very much on the final. So my work was based on a rougher kind of sensibility. Maybe David would like to um, throw some words of wisdom in our direction. Yeah, not this thing. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, I find very interesting the references you, you use. For example, the relationship to Matisse. For example, I, I, I learned a lot uh, about Matisse from your work, and this is uh, one of your best Matisse paraphrases. Uh, I wrote a, a, to the catalog in which I, I tried to figure out how human is represented in your abstract paintings. And in the center of this painting, a human figure, hidden, but if you can read the structure itself, then you will recognize that this is a standing human figure in the nature. And uh, this, this uh, hidden human uh, uh, figure uh, returns from time in, in your work, I think. And, uh, uh, I, I think it's a very strong point within that film because of, of this. And it brings us further to the, the other 80s works, uh, which, which are in the next one. So, so uh, I, I was always interested about this title, and I, I also wrote you an email about that, uh, because the title of this work is Adoration. And an art historian would immediately uh, uh, think of adoration of the Magi or adoration of the, the shepherds. Maybe David Carrier in his monograph or those about also about uh, that, that maybe he can find something from this iconography. But I don't find anything from, from, from adoration. But uh, finally, he said that it's also a sort of adoration of painting. Uh, or I would add to that, I don't know if you have painting uh, uh, geometry. We preserve you know, the, geometry, but it has uh, also essential quality. I think, David, one of the things this brings out, and this is David, good say, in the catalog about this, is how important the titles are for these paintings, because 
you know, bather and adoration really give you a big clue about yeah. what to look for, how to see them. It's very different if someone numbers the paintings. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. That's really... Yeah, similar. yeah, and it's very important. Ken Julier wrote an amazing essay about the titles, and I think titles, yeah. but Sean can tell what he thinks, but I think titles are very important parts of these books because you bring in uh, uh, the reference, the metaphors through the title in, in some cases, like the Arabi, uh, which is a reference to James Joyce, or the Besa, which is a reference to, to Matisse on the one hand, uh, to a whole iconography of, 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 right. of the Besa, from antiquity and uh, modern art, or like Matisse, or I don't know what's what one better. And yeah, in, in the case of adoration, I, 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 was, I was wondering whether it is real adoration or, or has anything to do with this Christian iconography we have time, uh, like Duccio or. Well, and uh, well, I'm mm. Can they hear us? I can hear you, but <laughs> yeah, it's like the video just cut out. They should be back. Right. Um, would you like me to pull up any images from the slideshow? Mm. Maybe you can find the paintings we've looked at, Adoration or Bather. There, I'm looking at the slides. Uh, there. Hmm. Perhaps you'd like to discuss some of them here. I can share my screen now. Oh, you know what? Let's look. Let's look at that cross grid we talked about. Yeah. Okay. There you got Bay there. Bay there. That's great. Yeah. Okay. The title is alarming. You hear the title Bay there, and you immediately think, "Am I supposed to think of Cezanne or, or earlier painting?" It's clearly yeah. it takes you yeah. back into the history of painting. But I, I love the. Um, to me, it feels very urban. It feels very, very constructed. As a painting, you're aware that the pieces don't quite fit. And, uh, um, and you could imagine someone nailing them together. So I always, even though Sean clearly wants to celebrate the painting of the past, I, I always found his work very contemporary and it's cobbled together feeling. I like that. It also reminds me of the lofts of the 80s, what it was like to walk up all those steps and, and oh. look at lofts that had a lot of unfinished wood in them. Um, you feel the wood in these paintings very much. You're aware of the materials. He doesn't like to completely slip back into the past. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right there. I think it's this kind of tension between the past and the present. Planks, uh, that's the word. You feel the planks of wood. Yeah, sure. The picture is made from, and you think, well, why don't they fit? I mean, it's interesting that he chooses to, to line up planks that don't quite fit together, right? And even more because these have a, a, a physical presence. They're really coming out some distance from the wall. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that physical I mean, it's very different from the, you know, the refinement of the Matisse in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we've talked about that, that Matisse is, a, you know, for all of his difficulties, is a bourgeois a French gentleman, you know, and Sean is very, comes from a very different world. 
And I think that's, you know, I mean, that's in a way what we're, we're playing with here now. Um, the colors, what about his palette? Sometimes, uh, sometimes the works in the 80s look autumnal to me. There's a lot of ochre and butternut uh, and soil. Yeah. Those kind of colors, things growing. Um, yeah. Grow, that, things that grow in the fall. What, what about you? What do you make of his palette? Earthy. Yeah, earthy and, and the, the, in a way the colors are like the panels, aren't they? They sort of bang together and yet they fit. It's a strange, I mean, I'm struck, you know, but it's interesting here because now when these are so familiar, you know, it's hard to think how strange they seemed at the time in the 80s to me. They weren't like anything, right? We can't and, know what it was um, like in the 80s. We can only know what it's like now. They still look pretty banged together. Yeah, yeah. That a is... of Elizabeth Murray that way, who, whose work always was kind of deliberately clunky. Right, it's right. Yeah, deliberate yeah. clunkiness to them that I, I find very satisfying. You feel like you're walking through a lumber yard. Sure, sure. And you know, that. you know, that story I think that's important is that when Sean had the, the loft in Tribeca, the loft was filled with lumber and that was the source of the frames. That's and right. so in a sense, when he uses all the lumber, <laughs> then, yeah, the loft was just a big empty space. It was exhausted in a way. It's very interesting kind of recycling, you know, a very literal relation to the city. He built his own stretchers. Somebody asked that question. Oh, yeah, he yeah. Built yeah. His own stretchers from the materials that he found in his studio when he moved in. Right, yeah. Deborah, David, I believe Sean and, and, and David are back here. I can see. Good, start. okay. Yeah. David, Sean, can you hear us? I see them and they're on. Now you see my face. Yes. Ah, there we are. Good. Good. Yes. He started to talk about hammering. Yes. Hammering. It's a very piece of the exhibition. You know, I took the um, title for hammering from Bob Dylan who I, you know, spent my adult life listening to, I consider him to be my um, studio companion. And of course, you know, it's nice to listen to a junior singing. And he, um, he made a song called Chimes of Freedom, the mystic hammering. And as I was painting this painting, it's, to me it seemed like I was hammering, because the paint is put down in a very rhythmical fashion. And uh, David, uh, David Fair just made an interesting point that this is a prototype or forerunner of uh, the Doric paintings, which I've worked on recently, which have been shown extensively in Europe, um, but not yet so much in America. They're amazing and we have Oh. Well, thank you for your patience with this. We are uh, experiencing some issues, but they should be back soon, and hopefully with a more stable connection. Should we go to the slides? We, we, well, we should, ex oh. Oh. we're back. We're back, and uh, there. Oh, the best. <laughs> there you are. As a firefly connection. Uh, let's put my mask up as I toddle on. This is, um, can you hear me, guys in yes. New York? Yes, we can. But, you know, this is a painting that's very dear to me, of course. I painted this um, as a lament for my son, and um, it's called Empty Heart. And you can see that the the painting is really based on a very simple color structure. The, the center is very dark brown, the outside is blue black or brown black, and then there's pink against a whiter color. And it seems strangely illuminated. 
most a peculiar ravaged light. So in one way it's a barren painting and in another way it seems quite lit up. And it's, why it's, it's a painting that um, is very important to me personally. So anyway, let's go in here. Um, and here you can see that David has made a very beautiful installation. Um, you know, interestingly, put a bonnet in between two small paintings. This is something that I do a lot. You know, I work on this scale and I, I love working on small things because they register differently. You know, there's nothing heroic about this painting. It's quite tender and intimate. And I really love doing that. I do a lot of small paintings and uh, they're very important to me. The edges of things are important, the way things are overpainted and the colors are, are never um, primary. Yeah. And in this bottom painting, you see that different parts of the painting are painted differently. You know, the faces are painted different from the background. And there's a lot of different styles at work in this little barn art. Whereas, you know, with, with a lot of um, modern art, the idea was to unify the style. But with this painter, you get the style broken up so that the painting has this interesting psychology in it. And I try to do that in a lot of my work, particularly with the inserts. You know, I try to paint them different from the body of the painting. And uh, here, you know, there's some paintings that relate to the Wall of Light paintings, I suppose. You could say, say it like that. Uh, this painting is called Vincent. Okay. Um, I, I painted the same painting three times with these, with these triptychs. Uh, again, I haven't shown this in America, I've shown it in Europe. They're all called names like Al Arben Vincent or Al, Al Nach Vincent. I was making these in um, a the studio in Germany. So basically making a portrait of a painting that I started out with, with the second one, and then doing the same thing with the third one, painting it again. So what's so interesting to me personally about these is that you can paint something endlessly. And because painting is so physical, so manual, you can't repeat it. No matter how you try, if you, if you, if you add expression, or even expressionism, and you mess up the color like I do, you're never gonna get the same result twice, and that's what these are based on. Maybe David wants to talk a little bit while I have it. Sean, I, it seems to me those paintings have no inserts, right? They don't have the wooden inserts. No, they have no inserts. So, and that, so that was a kind of leap in a way because you went from very yeah. fragmented imagery to working with the unaltered rectangle. Yeah, you know, these, these are quite recent paintings. I mean, I even regard these as current because I've made them over several years, the last several years. And, you know, I keep returning to things. I don't work in a linear sense. I don't just move forward one to the other, one to the other. I, I tend to circle back mm -hmm. and retrieve things that I've dropped. You know, I'm working with several different uh, motifs. 
So these, these are still very much in the present. And um, I, I, very, I like this idea of doing the same thing again. I mean, literally the same thing. And it's inexhaustible. And it says something very profound, I, I, I believe, about painting and about its possibilities, that they are simply in, inexhaustible, yeah. which is why painting, of course, is... Yeah, and recognition is very important for you, but from nearly from the beginning. So uh, it's just like that in the first room, you also repetition. So you're repeating the same motive in different colors. And this kind of sequential way of thinking returns uh, from time to time in your art. Uh, but it, it's interesting because it's a, there's a very strong reference to Van Gogh. So that's the reason why we gather these works together at one room. Because in yeah, these two rooms, we, one, one room we had dialogue with Bonar, and this is a dialogue with, with Van Gogh. But also, this sequential way of thinking reminds me a little bit how Monet did sequential paintings in different uh, day times. And mm -hmm. maybe it looks a little bit uh, similar, that as if you painted a wall or a floor, or I don't know what, in different day times. Or, or you mentioned that all of light uh, it goes back to your experience, how the sun changed the, the colors of the walls. Uh, how do you feel these works' relationship to Van Gogh on one hand and Monet on the other hand? Because uh, the colors are completely uh, recalling uh, what Van Gogh did. It's very strong yellowish colors, not clean yellows, but that. Uh, yellowish tones, uh, uh, bluish tones. But on the other hand, this sequential way of the presentation is, is rather a Monet-like. Uh, uh, what do you think? Well, that's interesting, you know, because when, when, uh, when I was up in Boston, I loved looking at those haystacks. I thought they were so interesting. Because basically he's painting a lump. He's painting a portrait of a lump of stuff. Mm. So that's relating related to Austin. And and just doing it again and again, of course, interested by in, influenced by film. So yeah, and obviously I, I learned something. I learned something from being up there and having access to those paintings in the um, museum. It's a wonderful museum. So, do you want to go to next? We can. Unless anybody else has it. Anything. Anybody else in New York has something they would like to say? <laughs> Usually people in New York can't be shut up, but we have forgotten yes, how to sir. talk during the pandemic. It's been so long since we've had conversations with anybody. Yes, and now you suffer. <laughs> and me, you know, I live, I live on the other side of the river in, in, in um, <clears throat> Serene, Serbia, with all the, with all the um, Trump supporters. <laughs> haranguing <laughs> and arguing about um, whether I've cut down my dead trees properly. <laughs> I have different problems. And oh, wow. here, the, this is a room of, um, it's a room I like very much. It's a room of various periods uh, of windows, windows and figures. Mm. Ah, there it says on the wall, windows and figures. So I got it right. Yeah, yeah, that was my <laughs> idea. And uh, look at that one, that one there, that, that little picture. It makes me think about my angle. Yeah. It was uh, one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. Yes, small works look like steel lives in some extent. They have the impression of being still lives. I don't like the idea 
that, you know, when I make exhibitions or when I have made exhibitions in the past, you know, people have just shown very big work and that makes a strange idea of what, what I'm doing because my work has a lot of um, delicacy in it, particularly the small ones or the works on paper, which this show does in fact demonstrate. This painting here has got painted figure and a cut out one. And that's a painting that's in the museum in Dresden. Is this I, cut out? Yeah. And this is it's one of my favorite paintings from that period. One of the things I like about it is the size. You know, it's not trying to be heroic. But you know, Sean, that one is interesting because in a way it's an anti-mirror because at least here, those two center rectangles come forward, right? You don't look through, but they, they push toward you. Yeah. There's a figure ground relationship. But yeah. it's important in nearly all of your works of this style. Well, on that figure one. Comes around and this, right. this is also a ground relationship. To some extent, I think. But nearly all window works. Um, well, you know, somebody who used one of these, this painting I actually showed. Uh, did I show that one in New York? You know, I can't remember anymore. I get muddled. I have to admit, I do get muddled up. But somebody said that those paintings were dealing with the idea of. Um, immigration and alienation, pulling things apart and putting them in the wrong place, which is an idea that I'm very interested in. Well, being an immigrant myself, I obviously, I feel the discomfort of it and I identify with the discomfort of it. And just just add one sentence that the, the title of the show Passenger has a lot to do with this issue, I think. Yeah. Because yeah, you have the serious passengers, which are a similar structure. I mean, there's an inset within a bigger structure, and and the title Passenger can be understood in some extent as a reference to this experience of being on way, finding new contexts finding new new situations, which is can, can be seen as a metaphor for your art in general, but for your personal life as well. Yeah. I so always, I always find that in the larger paintings, Sean, in the larger paintings, you do feel one form abutting another at a sharp angle. You're aware of forms clashing. Whereas in the smaller ones, you're more likely to feel the forms nuzzling each other and coming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Because the surface is easier for me to dominate. That's one thing. And the other thing is that they're not generally so um, emphatically slapped together. So they're not as aggressive mm -hmm. physically. I'm not as imposing. Here's some pastels. I was going to say that it works on paper. Yeah, that continues that process a step further that Deborah's describing, no? You know, this, this is a watercolor, yeah. which is, again, another medium that I, I love. And, you know, you can see here that the edges are made without a lot of physical effort. But th I think this whole issue of scale is, is, is indeed very important because it equals content in a way. And um, this, this, is a, this is a fairly recent pastel. Again, you can see the edges between, <laughs> between the blocks tend to make it uh, tremble. What have we got here? We have ah, the landline. Okay, now. My, my two favorite or three favorite rooms are just coming. Okay. All right. Well, maybe you could 
you could open the door and <laughs> show. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, we have here a generous selection from two of my very favorite groups of work: the Rose of Light and the Lamb Lights. And I think I will at this moment practice being a museum guard. Ah, this is actually a place for the museum guards. This yes. chair. So that's why I'm in the job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, the museum guards generally drive me crazy. We have to be the Doric painting I mentioned. Yeah, on the main wall, the back wall, this is uh, in the Atlantic. It's, uh, yeah, you can go take some steps back in the Atlantic. Or a general picture of this, this book, which is very strong and I think dominates the room. And uh, yeah, we have a few land lines. And yeah, here you yeah, can see as well the potential uh, uh, quality of your work that you you have one structure and, and you vary, vary, vary the colors and, and they completely change. Uh, and we have, we have another favorite piece here, the Ball of Light Zacatecas. Um, it has a Mexican uh, background, isn't it? Uh, so uh, there's one more aspect of your work about which we didn't uh, talk a lot, these auto uh, uh, references, uh, like, like uh, you could say. Yeah, David, if we can go back to that, uh, sorry. We can go back to the point about scale. In a way, these landlines because they go straight across and don't have any breaks or oppositions, they, in a way, at least here, they can look like smaller works. You know, it's very interesting. They're smaller scale because you can see those as a set of panels that can bang together, no? Wonderful. But they also, uh, they, they, sorry. There's some other sublime, and I think this, these works are about sublime or sublimity this word exists in English. And, uh, and yeah, they should be big. And, and I think uh, there are works that, that would, doesn't make sense uh, in a much smaller form. Uh, but but we, we try to find a balance in the exhibition between the small formats, the very big formats. We have very few really big paintings and we have middle-sized paintings. In terms of Sean's art, they are middle-sized paintings. What I love about those pictures is that they really link horizontal forms with the horizon. You wonder why, yeah. for instance, this wonderful on the left, the wonderful one on the left with all the blues. No, go back to it. Go back. This one. <laughs> this one. I mean, it's so simple, yet it's, it's so evocative of the sea. And, oh. and yeah, that, actually. How, how, does he, how does he get so much? Sean, how do you get so much? out of simple horizontal lines. Well. <laughs> They're full. They're full of feeling and landscape, despite yes. very restrained and stripped down forms. Well, it's a good question. Um, oh. One thing that, and uh, as, as the uh, existential threat to our environment has grown, and as I moved out of the city or next door to the city on the other side of the river, you know, I, nature has become more present in my work. That's clear. And it wasn't something that I did intentionally has just evolved. And these paintings clearly make a, re a reference to landscape. They're not trying to be uh, overwhelmingly rigorous or abstract. They're making associational references. So I'm feeding off of the natural world and I'm making an obvious picture of it whilst 
holding on to structural ideas of repetition because each one flattens itself out in a certain way and, you, and they are multiple horizon lines. But yeah, how I, I get yeah. so much out of it, that's by overpainting and having done it for a really long time. It's the only way I can really answer that question. Uh, and in your touch, you have a very distinctive touch. If the rest of us drew yeah, horizontal uh, lines on a sheet of paper, I don't think we'd get a sense of water moving and night and day and tides and all of that. Well, of course, I'm thinking that, you know, I am, I am almost, um, a Hudson River School painter because I'm <laughs> living on the, on the Hudson. That, well, he should be back any, any I moment. I blew the picture away. <laughs> I mean, my thought on this is that this, I mean, playing what Deborah was saying is, is that these are the banging of things together of 80s New York has really gone out of these, right? I mean, they're very rich, but they're not the rich of this, hitting this, hitting this, you know, and so forth. They're, they're these straight horizontals. Um, and they feel like mist as opposed to wooden planks. They feel misty, you feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sky and, are they coming back? They should Maybe be. Just coming. Mm -hmm. And Derek, I mean, you say something, I mean, I think of them also in relation to the sculptures now, no? All that horizontality? I don't know. I'm just thinking about the one on the right now, the green, the green painting. I mean, it's interesting yeah. that he never repeats any colors in the stripes. Each yeah. one is different. Yeah. So I think in that sense, they risk becoming, in that sense, they never become patterns or they don't feel so minimalist because the colors right. keep evolving. Right. It's not, but then look at those colors. You, I mean, if we look at the one on the right, if you tried to name those colors, could you even put a name on them? David, give me some names. The one on the right, I, okay, olive green in the middle. The one pale on blue at the top, and then the dark, the saturated blue second up from the bottom, oh. but then, then the very bottom line is quite different from the center line, isn't it? Different from the... Right, it's a different tone. It has some, it looks like the central color with some white mixed in. But if you had to put names on them, could you even name these? No, colors? no, I, could, I, could, I couldn't. I couldn't name. I couldn't. Anybody, anybody, look at the color on the bottom. How would you describe yeah. the color? Is that pea soup or celery? Or... <laughs> no, I see what you mean. I think, but... Part of it, I, I believe, is that overpainting, right? I mean, he paints yeah. over and over. In other words, it's not a color laid down, but it's a color and on top of a color, a color. Um, because right. sometimes it's really interesting to look at the, f when you have photos of the reworking of a painting, and that's fascinating oh. because colors disappear, you know? And then is the background all one color? If you look at the crevices and the color coming through, uh, I think that's the same. Is that all the same? sort of ultramarine blue? Well, it looks like Sean is back to answer that question. Excellent. <laughs> that <got it. laughs> the expert. Sean, can you hear us? Yeah. But I'm qualified to answer the question. I know that must come as a great disappointment since I'm supposed <laughs> to know what I'm doing. But I... <laughs> I really don't remember. <laughs> so you see the way I make the colors is on the painting. So I really don't know how they're gonna turn out. And I, I paint in layers until it's finished. And uh, it's very intuitive. My color sense has no, um, has no uh, strategy to it at all. You use a uh, ruler to mark out the lines beforehand. Are you using a ruler? No, I don't. I don't do anything. I just start painting. Actually, I'll show you where I start. 
and our, <clears throat> our wonderful cameraman here will, will stand behind me while I show you what, how I would start painting. So this painting, for example, I always start in the same place here. Mm. And I'll tell you why I do that, if you would like, if that helps. It's because it's the easiest thing to do. I do the first thing that I can do, which is to work the painting right in front of myself. And it's always in the middle somewhere. In this painting, I'm sure I would start to feel you know, here or here. In this painting, obviously, I was, I was making a green painting and got changed through the process of painting. And, you know, there's some, sometimes there are drips and I can't really fix that without losing the energy in the work. So I don't, I don't try to perfect it. it once once the painting has a kind of rhythm and an independence from me, it's finished. I'm not messing around with it after it's finished. As you can see, there are bits missing on the edges. Um, so it's a very spontaneous uh, process and I'm adding color all the time, one on top of the other. So the colors that, that I'm making are, um, very particular to the place and time and position that they occupy on the painting. So I, I can't really explain it any better than that. Um, you know, it's very intuitive, my, my color sense. I have sense. one question. Uh, um, what, how do you describe the difference between the canvas and the aluminum uh, uh, grounding? Because this one you painted on canvas, and this one was painted on aluminium, and uh, uh, there's a huge difference uh, in terms of texture, but how would you describe this difference, and how do you decide what to paint on canvas and what to paint on aluminium? Well, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, I answered that question for myself quite recently, and I've changed now to paint landlines, on, um, on metal because I love the way that the paint skids across on the metal. This is on uh, canvas, but um, this is an exception. This is an exception, yeah. And you can see that the surface is different. This part made, by the way, with wrong. Um, that, I mean, they're not very careful paintings. And the, the metal seems to assist this horizontal motion. Because when I'm painting them, it's almost like dancing in front of the, in front of the panel. And I tend to make the um, horizontal and vertical paintings, which I'm still making, on the, on the canvas. That seems to suit the canvas more because there's more, there's a stronger sense of structure. And with the, with the landlines, they seem to be much more about movement, side to side movement, almost like swaying when I'm making the painting. The Dorics are also metal. The Dorics are also metal. But they are cold, maybe it's because of coldness or... Yeah. Well, the simplicity of it is very impressive to me. Whereas the wall of light paintings, I, I generally make it on uh, canvas. Because I like, I, I like the slower quality of the, of the, of the um, junctions. And this is a little canvas. Well, this goes back to the idea of, um, you know, I could show you the back. How's it cut on the wall? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to.
It's, it's, a, it's a security issue, but oh, it's I your decision. Wanna, I don't want to take it off if, uh, if it's going to be a, a drag putting it back on. Anyway, we are in the last room now. We have one more. Oh, yeah. So we have the four last. Well, these, these paintings are quite recent. These, these paintings are really, um, I think, quite crazy. Um, this one over here uh, is one that I started in New York and I actually finished it in Berlin. Yeah, I have one question that was very interesting. You, I, I chose this painting, but it looked like completely different. Yes. And you made the decision to change it. Yes. Why did you make this decision? I love this painting yeah. so as well. It was painted in this. The, the, this form of the painting was made for the Budapest show, but what was the reason why we are, why you changed the, the, the you, well, you changed the inset? This painting, which is called Uninside Out, is a study on, in a way, turning the painting inside out. It's a study on imposing inserts into the painting and then also using one of the inserts in the wrong place. And I, I just thought before it was too close to a kind of minimal sensibility. And my work really is based on breaking with that. And I, I didn't want to return to that kind of refinement. So I made the painting a little bit more crazy. Yeah. Oh, let's say opulent, unreasonable, but it's one of my favorite paintings in the show. Yeah. Now, now this, okay. Um, look, this is a painting that Deborah will like very much. It's called Black Square. And David wrote about that in Amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. Hey. Okay. This, this painting deals with the threat to us and our Sorry about that. Hopefully, mm. looks like it's clearing up. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> well, should I pull the slide of this 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 painting? Yeah, if you can, if you can, Cal, that'd be great. Wait. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's really, I mean, all that black in the center, the way, I mean, how do we, how do we read that? I mean, there, you know, it's a landline, but then with that, that kind of Malevich in the center, I don't know, uh, that's strange. Well, it's great that we don't read it as an absence. We read it as another form. It could be a, a block uh, opposing the rest of the painting, but it, it doesn't feel, right. I don't feel a void there, do you? No, I agree with you. It's coming forward now, visually. Uh, it's a peculiar, but I mean, it's coming forward, but it's not positive. I mean, it does have that nihilistic sense, no? I mean, black, that's how... You, Right, right. It offers an alternative to the painting, the richness, again, of the butternut, ochre, uh, farmyard colors. Uh, and it, you feel like this is the alternative. This is a world without art, is, is the black square. So I, I feel like he is, again, contrasting to extreme, maybe growing and not growing, or, or maybe it's a tribute to geometric abstraction. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Tribute, or or do you feel an absence that something has been lost? 
Well, it's curious because, you know, I spoke about the nihilism, but when I look the way the square is placed, look, it's very nicely done. It's towards the bottom. It's not overwhelming. It's not dominating the picture, right? But it's certainly not invisible. <laughs> it's a peculiar kind of calculation of that, no? Very odd. It's appealing, though. It's handsome, isn't it? Yeah. That, Cal, I see you nodding your head. I think it, in the end, I guess what it says to me is that this is a painting. This began as a painting, and it's about geometry and abstraction. Yeah. yeah. It kind of pulls you away, I think, from the more naturalistic feeling of the colors in the background. If you go away, if you go back to what Sean was back. saying. We need Sean to come back and tell us. If yeah, I know. Uh, here. Uh, here. We're supposed to read the black squares <laughs> in the center. I think the windows. Back. He's back. Okay. okay good. Okay, so is Sean here? No more. I see Sean. I can see the. Can you hear us? Yes. Sean how, Sean, how are we supposed to read the black squares in the center of your recent paintings? Do you see them as voids or do you see them as presences? And if they're presences, what are they presences of? <laughs> Very good. Well, they are uh, oh. I would say. Shall we return to the slides? Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. that's tricky. Sorry for all this. Oh, I see some movement. There, I got it. Yeah. His hands are moving. That's a good sign. <laughs> He's live. Patient is alive, exactly. <laughs> okay, we can't. <laughs> he hear left him. us. He left us. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Well, maybe. Okay, let's go back to the slides for now, and and when when he's when he's um, available, okay. we can we can discuss. There, I saw this painting. Oh, wow. Um, next to the other one, maybe that one. Yeah. Right. Oh, strange. Because in a way, this is way back to those 70s, isn't it? I mean, those kind of horizontal running, but then uh, complete other things going on. Very odd. It's a very jazzy painting. It's very jazzy. And I like, I like the black lines against white because they remind me of writing. And then you right. give the whole painting a kind of blackboard. And, yeah. and is it? Is it about the gesture and the hand and the and the um, writing of an artist? You feel that in this picture more than some of the others. I think you're aware of the artist graphology. Right. It's also this sense of nothing being lost, isn't it? That I mean, you can return and spiral around and reincorporate older styles, older motifs, and that, that's. Fascinating. And here again, they were in those colors. Look at that, the very bottom right, that pink. Well, how would you name that? You see that pink and then that. Salmon, is that a salmon pink? No, oh, I'm not getting there. The two pinks are different. The bottom one is overlaid with some white. 
So again, yeah. reminded that each stripe is a different color. He's not repeating. And, no. and I think this ties into what he said, which I thought was very interesting just now about how the colors evolve as he's working on the painting and every, right. every color is a response to the previous color. Right. Yeah. No, that whole discussion, I mean, I just pick up a little on that. I mean, I thought, well, here we have his roots in abstract expressionism, that whole talk about how, you know, the activity goes. And you could think it was almost, you know, the Kooning speaking, no? I mean, in terms of how it works, though the result is so different. But that's in a way the puzzle. See de Kooning in the richness of the flesh tone. Yeah, exactly. I don't really, in, in, in the lushness of the paint. Yeah. There's a very strange looking back, looking ahead. I mean, that, that whole peculiar relation to time is just really intriguing to me. Very amazing. While we wait, are there any other works you'd like to talk about? Is there, do we want to take questions? Why don't, should we let Why don't we take, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's go to questions. It right. seems like many of the questions are directed towards Sean. Um, mm -hmm. so I believe that he'll be coming back <laughs> soon, hopefully. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, is, is there? Okay, so I, I'm intervening right at the moment. Okay, uh, hi, hi, Sarah. Sarah. hi, David. I think that I suggested uh, Kyle contacting Faye and ask Sean to come in near the Wi-Fi in the office so we can clearly hear him and David. So my, my, um, my, one, th my one question I want to bring up to see whether you both have something to respond to as well as Sean when he comes in is the, the, the most peculiar thing about Sean to me when I first exposed to his work in the late 80s when I came to New York, experienced several show at David McKee, um, is when he just now, early on, talking about Matisse, and you certainly wrote about that too, David. Yeah. And the interesting thing about Matisse, when we take Matisse, especially when Elderfield, John Elderfield curated that amazing show at right. the Radical Invention, focusing on 1913 to 17. So right. Matisse coming back from Morocco, realized he's, you know, 12 years older than Picasso, felt a great need to catch up with Cubism. Yeah. And what's interesting about Cubism for him, that he never really undertook, have gone through the analytical Cubist phase. He jumped right into synthetic Cubism. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I find is very interestingly similar to the way that Sean have talked uh, about synthetic cubism. But the other thing why hearing you, Deborah, when you talk about those early works, the stripe that associate with the clunkiness, with lumber, with wood and so on. I also think there's a certain point where painting became more black and white and you know tonal and it's also relates so much metallic feeling. So it's both wood and also metal. And it's interestingly the way that he paint when now you reference to the Kunin, which is the condition of temperature in Sean's work that always interested me. Yeah. So that means it's always seen wet. You never seen a Sean's yeah. Yeah, painting sure. dry. You right. know, yeah. that's something that the Kunin always try to um, amplify, particularly when he moved to East Hampton, whether in the direct relationship to the water there or not. Mm -hmm. But I think from the late 16 onward, <laughs> it always have that sense of wetness in the paint, in the painting. So that temperature, I think with Sean allow, whether it's an urban association um, or, or sublime, which is something the curator also brought up the sense of water or nature, all together. It's very peculiar in between urban and landscapes, I always felt. What's built and what is nat natural, you know? Right, right. What do you think of that, David? Yeah, I, th I think that's important. I mean, part of this is the, you know, the relation of Sean's art to his moves. You know, we talked earlier about 
coming to New York and then moving out of the city. But I mean, it, it, it's elliptical, it's elusive, right? Because it isn't mechanical. It's not like, he's not like he's going out to the country and then painting pictures of trees. Um, I, like, I feel like one is always aware that he is breaking the wholeness, the ideal of modernism. That he came up at a time, if we're talking about him in relation to Matisse and the modernists, he, he lets us know that there is never a, a unbroken surface. He breaks right. the surface. Right. In that sense, I find him very urban. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of the works absolutely are pastoral and they and they're, they're right. so, I mean, you look at them and you think Moby Dick, they're amazing, they're so evocative of the yeah. city. But generally, I think of him as somebody who literally splintered the mm -hmm. modernist stream. And to me, his work will always be essentially urban for that reason. Right. That's, yeah. And the sculptures, Deborah, how would you put, we saw the one there a little in, in this show. How would you put the sculpture in this, like here, okay. How would you put this in the plan? <laughs> the painter would sculpt. It's a painter's sculpture. Yeah. Oh, I think they're back. Wow. Let's have them. <laughs> To present, I quite a ride, but I think they are back. Because we don't want to miss these, this, these recent, the figurative works. Sean, are you there? There he is. Hey, you see me? Yes. yes. Okay. So we are. In fact, in the last room, and um, as you know, I made paintings of my son in a Lutero, which in fact Deborah saw out in Tapan when I first made them. So I've been shown quite a bit in. Um, <clears throat> In, uh, anyway, so David Fair, that is, wanted to make a room of them, and here they are. Yeah, so very David, good. over to you. It was a great surprise for everyone, I think, when Sean turned to figuration or returned in some extent. And he had a great show at Albertina last year with the Eleuthera paintings, which travel now due to COVID. I think they're stuck somewhere, but they will continue traveling. And first I asked Sean, to have something to put together. Let's see the most confirmation of That they really added and the sheet together. This Vienna exhibition was, was, was really very interesting because uh, I realized that uh, Sean builds up this figurative painting from the very same gestures as he built up uh, his abstract works. And uh, somehow well, I had the impression that he showed something what is behind the wall. Because in his work, I think, in every case, there is a human behind the wall, which we don't see, but we feel. And uh, in this very exceptional case, the old... <laughs> Should we move to poetry? I uh, think. Yeah, you know, this is. Is it time okay. for poetry? Yeah. I think yes, never. I think you're because, yeah, this is a. To rescue us from technology. Okay. We we should maybe uh, maybe Kyle, we should just say that we did press the gallery 
uh, you know, we knew that this would be a hard connection. There's a, a physical problem with the walls, just to explain what we, we found in the rehearsal yesterday. And we were aware that this was going to be dicey. So I'm just thankful that we got as much as we did. Uh, I think that is worthwhile, even if I understand it's a little bit of a seasickness effect. You know? <laughs> like Likewise, I think I think we got some uh, great stuff out of Sean and David. And, oh, yeah, good. And, um, apologies to the uh, to the audience for the questions that have been um, that have been posed, but um, unfortunately, it seems as though Sean will not be able to uh, to answer them. Um, okay, so at the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem, and we've carried that into these community events. And I welcome Matthew Rohrer to the stage. Matthew Rohrer is the author of 10 books of poetry. Most recently, The Sky Contains the Plans and the Others. He has participated in residencies at MoMA at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, and his poems have been widely anthologized. He teaches at NYU. Matthew, I will ask to unmute you now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, um, for sticking around. I'm going to read just two very quick short poems from my new book, The Sky Contains the Plans. Uh, and I just wanted to explain quickly how these poems came about. I um, became fascinated by the hypnagogic state, which is that state between wake and sleep. You're probably all familiar with, you, you, as you start to fall asleep, you hear maybe voices. Apparently some people see things. Um, I heard voices, so I trained myself to, to fall asleep with a notebook and, and gather these strange voices. And I, and I wrote down a hundred lines uh, that came to me in that hypnagogic state. And the challenge was to make them the first lines of poems. Um, mm. what, what was amazing about them to me, I, I assumed they would be mystical and, and otherworldly and, and therefore super poetic. And it turned out they were, they were terrible. They were awful or they didn't make sense or they were certainly like nothing I would ever write myself. So that actually, that became even more fun uh, that challenge of having to proceed from, from some you know, ridiculous places. Um, so the first one I'll read, um, is the, the line that came to me was, did you eat your blossoms on time? So the poem goes, <laughs> did, did you eat your blossoms on time? I called out to all the diners in a restaurant made entirely of blossoms, singing beautiful little snatches of songs as I floated past. And when I awoke, you were entangled in me and still asleep. The lonely sound of a room at night bent its strings to my ears. In some cultures, this is a form of meditation the Chinese used to eat blossoms until they vomited halos of flowers into the fields. But the silence preceded me and surrounded me. I lay perfectly still wrapped around you, an image of us in my mind, boating across all the wine we've drunk together in the slow turn of evening. Uh, and I'll read one, one last one just because it's, um, it's about art or at least the line that came to me in, in my sleep seemed to be about art. The line was, I follow art. It goes places and I come with it. So here's the poem. I follow art, it goes places and I come with it like a sparrow tossing my head in the dust and then hurrying to follow the other identical sparrows. All the while thinking I am the superior being among all you sparrows because you cannot see what is inside me. It is a little victory to keep that hidden. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, David and Deborah and Sean and David you, out there somewhere. Thank you too. This has been really um, a lot of technological hiccups, but really a wonderful conversation. And, and I'm very grateful that we could, we could see the show, I, I think. Even. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for their patience. Yeah, I loved. I loved going to Budapest on my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so this October marks the Rails' 20th anniversary, and we're committed to remaining independent, free, and accessible to all. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Uh, please join us tomorrow for a conversation for for a radical poetry reading with Anson Berrigan and Monica Della Torre, featuring political poetry read by um, El Eleni Sikolnos, uh, Christopher Perez. Uh, Gabriela Howardji, Uche Duca, and Asiwa Wadud. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. <laughs>
Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Excellent. Thank you. Goodbye, Bye. and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your reading, Matthew. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you Paul. Bye. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Merci. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you, David and Deborah. That was great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. 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 This is what Kant say from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing <laughs> straight. So <laughs> it's wow. okay. We all embrace it. We we love the glimpse into Sean, great show. Uh, and I'm sure we get to talk to him further. So he's a dear friend and a great artist as he is. So we admire him. And congratulate on the big show, Sean and David and his friend who have put it. It's an amazing show together. So we have traveled there to Budapest. Uh, so that's, for that, we are grateful. And again, thank you, Nebra. Thank you, David. Thank you, Faye, for giving a hand. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, sending love and courage. And I think we deserve to have a good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Much love.